I was with Children's Television, BBC Children's, for 25 years. And, um, and then I wrote, in the latter half of that, I wrote 23 series of programmes and presented them as well. <clears throat> and the amazing thing was, I had no qualifications except for two O-levels. So I was a failure at, my, at school. And I suppose that's why I'm in education today, because I feel that we don't squeeze enough out of our kids and we don't find enough of their potential. So, when I did my programs, if I had an audience, I always had audience participation. So, will you participate? Will you? Very good, very good. Right, I have a card here. Well, I'm going to choose people to assist. And it's very simple. I've got an arrow for pointing people over there, and an arrow for pointing people over there. All I've got is a card with an arrow on the front side, ball on the top side, arrow on the back side, ball on the top side, arrow on each side, ball on the top side. Are you with me so far? Right. If I turn this around, the front side is pointing to the right side, the other back side is pointing to the... To the to the left side. So what I've actually got is an iron each side on the opposite sides. The front one goes down, back one goes up. Iron each side on the opposite sides. Front one goes left, back one goes right. Iron each side pointed to opposite sides. So if it's turning around the front is pointing up, behind the back must be pointing up. Why am I showing you this? Because I like you, I think you're nice. And I want to be your friend. And I want to make friends with you, because that's what you must do as teachers, make friends with your kids. You've got to make friends. How do you do that? Bribe them. Give them presents, give them sweets. But that costs money, so give them things that don't cost much. Give them some of these. Make these for your kids. All you need is a square card, an arrow on the front going up, and an arrow on the back going... Sideways. It goes sideways, and when you turn it, you don't turn it like that, and you don't turn it like that, you turn it on the diagonal. On this diagonal, the arrow points the same way. On this diagonal, the arrow points the opposite way. What is it? What's a rubbish? How dare I start a lecture with this? Well, it gets people interested, so come forward, don't block the gangway. I'll get rid of this, I'll just throw it. It should go right round and come back. It's magic, isn't it amazing? Right, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Oh, I've, I mustn't start there. I'll start at the very beginning, I won't do that. What you need to do when you're teaching kids, you need to give them a hook. When you're buying software here, the software needs to be hooky. It needs to give you a hook to get your kids' attention. Then it mustn't just be a game, it needs to educate and move forward. One of the hooks I've used frequently is the Great Pyramid of Giza. Why? Arguably the heaviest building in the world still today. 4,700 years old. How much stone in the original building? The mass is very easy to work out. But it's enough stone to build a wall two meters high, 18 centimeters wide, that would stretch from the pyramid in Egypt to the North Pole. Isn't that a beautiful fact? One building. Who built it? People who love maths. Here it is, almost nude, as it were, because its outer skin was as shiny as this, which is the boathouse today. Oh, look. Can't do that again. The boathouse there. That was all nicked to build the city of Cairo. So all you've got is the innards of it. But it's still remarkable. The mathematicians were brilliant. They decided, and they developed the pyramids till they got to this shape the ultimate in their mathematics. Why choose this shape? If you take the height of the pyramid, make it into a radius, the distance round the circle that it produces, 322 meters, but the distance round the four base edges of the original pyramid, 322 meters, it's the same. Herodotus knew that, but didn't know, as we don't, whether they did it intentionally. Also, this shape gives you the height of the pyramid, which if you square it, gives you exactly the area of the sloping side. Isn't it beautiful? There's also golden ratio in there, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I got Newman's World of Mathematics, full volumes, still in print, and there, in literally about a page 100 of 5,000, it says the Egyptians were pretty stupid at maths. A thousand years after they built the pyramids, they couldn't multiply. Well, not mathematically. <laughs> yes, they could, could only double.
That's all they could do. They could only do the, do the two times table, which is pathetic. How would you manage if all you could do is your two times table? I'm going to show you. Give me two numbers less than 20, any two you like. 14 and 9. 14 and 9. Thank you very much. 9 and 13, yes. Why have I ignored you? 914s is 926. Right, that's, that's fair enough. So we've done that. Let's do 9 times 13 because I've got it written up here. If the Egyptians wanted to multiply two numbers, they'd write them down and then ignore them. And they'd write down on the left one, then two, then four, then eight, possibly the 16. But as we are only multiplying by nine, we don't need anything bigger than eight. So we don't need 16. Then a little bit of maths. 13 is, is the, the, the other number you're using. So you double it to 26, to 52, to 104. You've got enough now. Four each side. The Egyptians are told there's only one way to make nine from these numbers on the left hand side. You can make every number up to 15 using addition. That's one, that's two, where's three? Two plus one. Where's nine? Eight plus one. 104 plus 13, 117. Nine times 13 is 117. Do it the other way around. 13 times nine, you've doubled nine to 18 to 36 to 72. 13 is 8 plus 4 is 12 plus 1. So you add this one and this one, 108 plus 9, 117. It works for any numbers. And it's binary. It's the very gubbins that makes all of this work. And in 1998, it was cut out of the British mathematics curriculum. Why? Because the people who formulate the British curriculum are mental. There's no other word, and I'm guarding my language. I could put it stronger. Now it's back. Gove and Powell's are putting it back. Absolutely right. Go about age nine or ten, you'll be meeting binary. And apps to explain binary will be so powerful and so quick, and the kids love it. I've seen nine-year-olds hit. I can count in binary. I said, "Well, go on, mate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. and they count on their fingers in binary. It's just beautiful to watch. And they're eight and nine years old. Let's stretch our kids. Binary is wonderful because you see what you've done is added the bottom one and the top one. If you score these numbers with the ones you use, 1001, you've got 1001, which is the binary number for 9. Punch 9 on the calculator, up comes 9, but there's no 9s in the calculator. Electronic switches go on, off, off, on. 1001. 10, on, off, on, off. Why? On, off, on, off. 104 and 20, plus 26, 130, 10 times 13. It's beautiful. That's one ounce. Okay. There are lots of things you can do to hook your kids. This is a very well-known picture produced by Leonardo da Vinci. Absolutely right. We know that, why? Because the writing is backwards. Why did he write backwards? To annoy his teachers. My grandson wrote three backwards. No other letter or number. Why? And we couldn't cure it. Why? Because he just wanted to be different. And we were trying to beat the difference out of him. What are we playing at? It's the difference in all of us that makes us. So let's stop warping all our kids into the same bottle, the same shape. Let's let them be what they are. Let's utilize our intellect. On the subject of intellect, if you have a kid who's bright in your class, do you make an enemy of, it, an enemy of him? You better not. Because if you do, it'll be a thorn in your side. Make friends with the kids whose brains are firing quicker. Make friends with them. Make them mentors to help you teach the others who are slower. That's the way to do it. Utilize them. Make them realize their worth because their brains are working faster. That's the way to do it. Give them things that really get them to learn very quickly that they've got something that's new, a new skill. So with this, let me explain. Could you stand up, please, sir? And why have I chosen you? Because you're a smart lad, and I've got, had a good day. Come and stand here. I also like to be, because the camera's over there. Right. That, sir, is your stature, your height. Yeah. Step away, and you can see it. There it is. One middle finger touch the carpet there. The other middle finger reach up and touch this. And look at that. Okay. I stand up. And that's your stature. And it's the same. Give this lad a round of applause. And he explains why this man is in a square, because that was the intention. 
now you know that. Just showing five-year-olds this, your five-year-olds can now measure your school hall. How? By simply going bonk, 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 or stringing them all together. The kids are about the same size, so the stature is going to be roughly the same, and it's enough. And you've got the understanding of measure before you get into meters, centimeters, millimeters, um, gas meters, any other meters. You've, you've really got them into measuring. This is what you need to do. This is an aid to measurement. Ask me the, answer me this. You all know this. What point is halfway up your body? The point halfway up your body is your belly button, your navel. Is that what you're going to say? Your waist? Yes? No, it's not. Halfway up your body is your hip bone or your pubic bone, just before things start to get interesting. That is halfway up your body, and it's there, the dotted line there. The, the navel is the center of the circle, and it's one span higher. And if you put your arm up, you're a cubit or two spans higher. So now you're ten spans high. Your stature is only eight spans. The center is this line here, which is four spans high. This is an eight measurement. We all know it, and we learn nothing from it. I lectured to 300 surgeons and doctors, and they all said, your navel is halfway up your body. And they're surgeons and doctors. It's crazy. The great thing about this is it indicates exactly what education is. Where did the artist get the idea from? Where did da Vinci get the idea from? He nicked it. He stole it from Vitruvius, who lived 1,400 years earlier, who was responsible with others for building the Colosseum in Rome, which went broke because the lions ate all the profits. Now, <laughs> Vitruvius designed this. So this is the essence of education. All education is theft. So when you're worried about photocopying a picture, forget it. You want school in thousands, photocopy the damn thing. People who write brilliant music can no longer copyright it to effect because we all download it for free. So don't worry about this. Education is the theft of knowledge. We're all in the game and we pass it on to our kids. Stop worrying about that and show your kids that if all they're learning is knowledge that's been created before, it's been done by other people, what's difficult about learning? You're not learning something new. You're not inventing a new wheel. You're learning exactly what people have learned before you. How can it be difficult? And that's the secret of education. You've got to have hooks. You've got to have design ideas. The wonderful story about Eratosthenes um, working out the distance around the earth is fabulous, but I'm not going to go into that now. I'm going to go into something much more simple that Eratosthenes did, which explains how simple it can be. This was used by Descartes as the first item in the geometry. And he said at the beginning of the geometry, if you understand the length of a few lines and a few angles, you can measure absolutely anything. Two illustrations to illustrate the point. This is the Messolet compass produced by Eratosthenes, 2,200 years old. With this device, you can multiply any two numbers or divide any two numbers. How? Let's multiply 34,700. No, no, hang on. I get carried away. Let's multiply three times four. <sighs> Thank God for that. Right. All you do is you take a rule. Try this with your kids of any age. The older they are, the quicker you do it. That's all. Any age. You draw a line. Centimeter divisions is fine. Draw another line. At what angle? It doesn't matter. Any angle works. Okay? And now, if you draw a line through... If you want three fours, let's start with drawing a line through the one and the three. And you've got a picture of one three. Now you want four threes, so you draw a parallel line through the four. And you'll find that it will always pass through the result, which is 12. 1, 3 is 3, 2, 3 is 6, 3, 3 is 9, 3 and a half, 3 is 10 and a half. So using decimals, you can multiply any two numbers. Division, very simple. Divide 12 by 4, line to the 12, line to the 4. Parallel line to the 1 gives you the answer on the top line, 3. It couldn't be any easier. Do we show this to our kids? No. Why not? It's so clear. It's so clear basic in its understanding. Why don't we show it to them? 
That was the first instance that he used. This was the second one. I'm not going to show it you yet. I'm going to show you what Descartes thought was wonderful. I showed this to Richard Dawkins at a, at a lunch at the BBC. And he was mesmerized by this because he didn't know about it. Could you, sir, hold that? Thank you very much. <coughs> this is the second example of the introduction to the geometry. How about this? Using a straight line and a pair of compasses, you can find the square root of absolutely any number. So let's start with an easy one, nine. Thank goodness. The square root of nine, all you do along, along, along a ruler or along a ruled line is count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You've got nine. What you do now is you add one. Why? Because that, that's what makes it work. <laughs> but that's what Descartes said. Unity is very important. If you're solving a problem, start with one. And if that doesn't work, move on. Every journey starts with one step, so start with unity. So you've added one, and now you've got a line of ten. Half of ten happens to be five. One, two, three, four, five. So with five as center and five as radius, you draw an arc. You could draw a circle going from here through the zero back through the ten. But all you need is the arc. You raise the perpendicular from the nine, and where that line meets that curve, that line is always exactly the square root of that for any number. How simple does it have to be? And do we teach it? Do we hell? So this is what's wrong with us. I can show you that. Can you see this happens to coincide with the 3, 4, 5 triangle? But there it is. Alfred Russell Wallace, who's been dead a hundred years this year, so he'd be there by now, but Alfred Russell Wallace was told that a fellow who was a flat earther said he'd put his telescope down the Bedford level, a long canal in Bedfordshire, and could discern no curve, therefore the earth was flat. And in about 1880, he put up 500 pounds for anybody who approved otherwise. Alfred Russell Wallace, imagine this, took two punts. Cambridge was only 16, 20 miles away. Two punts and put them on the old Bedford level. He put a theodolite on each one yard from the water surface, a telescope on a stick, and he had a man with flags on each. And he dragged them apart until both men agreed that their theodolites, line of sight, coincided exactly with the surface of the water as it curved in the middle. He then took the distance from the punt to that, squared it, and he had the diameter of the earth within half of 1%. Isn't it beautiful? So a little bit of knowledge is so powerful. That's what we need from all these producers of software that are helping with our education. We need stuff that concisely, quickly, and positively puts their kids' knowledge on another level. We do not want bloody games that go on and on as long and keep the kids happy. Because while the kids are happy playing the games, they're learning nothing except about the game. It's essential we burst through this idea, oh, you're 11, you only learn this when you're 11, and that you'll learn when you're 13. The curriculum is a test for testing teachers and schools, not children. The curriculum is only there to test you not children at all. So please spend half your time doing the curriculum, on the other half take the kids where you damn well want in terms of education. And burst them through and show them things. We know I've seen de demonstrations today from young kids, um, 11 and 12, who are demonstrating IT. They can grip it. So they can grip a much stronger curriculum now. But do we go faster than the curriculum? No, we don't. But we must, and that's why we must use this technology to allow us to do this. It's very important. How long have I done? <laughs> I really feel, because of this ridiculous theatre, I really feel like I'm on a soapbox at Hyde Park Corner. So I keep laughing at myself. But there we are. Uh, we're going to a, a bit of fun to finish with. I mean, I've got to finish now, really. Oh, I'll blow it. I'm doing it. 
Isaac Newton, the greatest British scientist of all time. Brilliant, why? Because he discovered the force of rubbish. Science doesn't work like that. He came up with gravity on the end of a progression. It started with a lad called Galileo. Galileo realized, can you hold that because I need it again, but it's not the one I want at the moment. Right. Yep. Galileo realized that things as they fell speeded up. He said, I haven't done this this, this week. I'll do this, it's lovely. Galileo said nothing can go this way and then that way unless it stops. When you throw a ball up, it stops and then comes down. So it slows down till it stops and then it speeds up coming down. He said nothing can go this way and that way unless it stops. So how can you tell a happy mot motorcyclist? You can always tell a happy motorcyclist by the dead flies on his teeth. When a fly flies into a motorcyclist's teeth, what is the last thing that goes through its mind? It's bum. Yes. If a fly is going this way at one kilometer an hour and it meets a motorcyclist going this way at 70 kilometers an hour, suddenly the fly is going that way at 70 kilometers an hour. So, Galileo said the fly can't go that way and that way unless it stops. And at the moment it stopped, it's touching the motorcyclist's teeth. So the question is, does the fly stop the motorcyclist? And you'd all say no, and you'd be wrong. Because if the fly weighs a ton, it will stop the motorcyclist. So it's all a question of degree. And that's what science is all about. Everything you measure in science is you measure, you measure by degree. And we've got to get that across to the kids much earlier than we do. Anyway, Galileo discovered how things come down. Can you, can you stand up? Bring that with you. Or put, no, put that down. No, bring whatever you like. Right. Uh, puts two fingers between the cues. He couldn't work out the speed of a ball falling because he had no watch. There were no watches. So he rolled it down a plank and he used horse hair. We're told he measured it with water dripping and he did. It wasn't as accurate as his horse hairs. Because when he put the horse hairs there, he heard the cannonball go bump, 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 bump over the horse hairs. And then he spaced them out until he heard bump, 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 a regular beat. I'm going to tick as I let it go, tick as it punches each mark, listen to the tick, 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 tick. Pretty accurate. That's as long as I'm not doing anymore because that's too accurate. That's very, thank you very much. He took four months because timing that one is the most difficult one. But he eventually came up with it and he knew he had the right answer. And what is the right answer? Whatever that distance is in the first e period of time, in the second equal period of time, how far does it go? It's definitely further. It's exactly three of them. In the third equal period of time, it's exactly five of them. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. Add them as you go along. One plus three is four. Plus five is nine. Plus seven is sixteen. Twenty-five. Thirty-six. All the square numbers. Everything that rolls downhill or falls increases speed by the square of the distance. He got it. Okay? He got it and that was that. He went out to fire a cannon. and he fired a cannon and found it always falls off the line you fire it on. Some force pulls it down. He didn't know what the force was, but he knew how it worked. If that is one unit, then in the second equal period of time or equal distance, it won't fall two of those, it'll fall two times two or four. Then three times three or nine, then 16. And that's a parabolic curve. He worked it all out, he died. Along came Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton added more, because some of Kepler's math was brilliant and some was actually wrong. But Newton added more. This is what Newton said. If a planet is this far away, there's a certain force required to hold it in orbit. Twice as far, only a quarter of the force required to hold it in orbit. Planet here, certain force required to hold it in orbit. Planet half as near, four times the force is needed to hold it in orbit. You can feel it with this toy. And Newton made one because Kepler made one, and Robert Hooke made one, and it's in the Library of the Royal Society today. Isn't it a brilliant toy for explaining these things? However, that's what he discovered. 
Newton read, Galileo, uh, Newton read Galileo's book on things falling and Kepler's book on things going around the sun and he said, I know what I'll do. As it's the same mass, I'll put the two together and I'll call it gravity. We call him the greatest British genius of all time. He read two books. So all your students have to do is read the right books, two, three, five, six or eight. And by the time they're 24, your students could be a genius at the leading edge of their discipline against anyone else in the world. That's what genius does and is at 24. But only if you kick your students forward and give, the, give them the idea that there is no top to the learning. No, oh, you can't learn that till you're 13, or you can't learn that till you're 16. There is, should be no such statement ever. Whatever you, Marie Curie, um, um, sorry, <laughs> Maria Montessori, thank you very much. I get older and names go. Maria Montessori said, you never teach a child anything. You let them play until they're ready to receive. And when they ask the question, you pour information in until their eyes glaze over. You take them as far as you can at this time because if their minds are open, they'll receive it. And that's what you must do. And that's what, we, 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 where have I gone? I've no, no idea where I've gone now. Except to say that genius is so possible in so many students, but, the, but achievement, more than average achievement, is achievable by 99% of your students. Why can't this happen with all children? all children so that's what we've got to ask exhibitions like this will you provide us with tools that empower our learning and our teaching will you be ambitious will you stop just delivering what the curriculum says and saying well we've done enough now because if you do that you're stealing money and you really should be busting your gut to help us all of us become better teachers better deliverers and our kids become the, the students that potentially they could be. This is what these fairs are all about. It's all about you shaking the tree with all these providers and saying, come on, give us it better, please. Give us it better, bust a gut to improve it and make education for everyone better than it's ever been. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. <clears throat>